to everything. Tell me where's your heart to go? I need a little sunshine, baby. Don't want no maybe. I'm missing you tonight. You know you got me going crazy. I love. The sheer math of climate change has become so overwhelming that everyone recognizes that we need to do this. This is going to be a really pivotal year. Carbon capture. Wind and solar. Electrified vehicles.
This is just the beginning. Welcome to the Axios Harris Poll 100 virtual event. I'm Nicholas Johnston, the editor-in-chief of Axios. I'm coming to you from Axios headquarters in Arlington, Virginia. Today, we're here to discuss the annual Axios Harris Poll and the 2021 rankings. This is an annual survey that unveils the reputation scores of the most visible brands in America. Welcome to our audiences on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, and on Axios.com. Join the conversation today on Twitter at Axios and hashtag Axios events. Over the next 30 minutes, I'll be joined by my colleague, Sarah Fisher, Axios reporter, and we'll reveal which brands have become America's favorites and how the past year has impacted their reputations. Up first is my guest CEO of the Harris Poll, John Gerzma, from coming to us from New York, New York. John, welcome. Hey, Nick, how are you? Great to see you. Let's maybe kick this off. Give us a sense of how this poll works and comes together. Sure. Uh, Nick, this is our third year doing this together, and this is a very robust survey. So we are talking to Americans. Uh, this year, we talked to 43,000 Americans uh, in early April to really get a sense of understanding of how they think about corporate reputation. I think what's unique about it is we're not talking to opinion elites. We're actually talking to the ordinary Main Street people. It's weighted to national population. So it's the people that are actually buying a company's products and services. And we go through it in two ways. We start by asking in the first wave of our sample, about 20,000 Americans to ask them to name two companies that have the best and worst reputations in America. And as we sum up those, we get to a hundred most visible. So what are the most salient companies that are on the minds of Americans? Then in the second wave with an entirely different sample, we go through and we rank order those 100 companies, literally like on a bell curve, like grading from, from A to F, and really trying to understand how they perceive them with respect to each other. And we're looking at that across a number of different dimensions. We're looking at it from vision, to products and services, innovation and quality. But we're also looking at culture, ethics, trust, and citizenship. So it gives us a really good understanding of sort of where companies are today. So looking at the data now, what are the top lines that jumped out for you? Really interesting. So you know what we saw this year was a year where COVID started finally in the spring to recede in the memory of some of the Americans. And, and when there was a right. shift, a couple of really big things that, that happened. One was the extraordinary performance of pharma, as we can kind of get into it. We had Moderna on our list in the top 10 for the first time. We had Pfizer also in the top 10. Uh, we had J&J, &J, didn't perform as well, but also uh, noted in there. So pharma, obviously, given uh, the incredible focus on science. But it was also a really good year for Elon Musk. Both his companies are in the top 10, both SpaceX and Tesla. I think, again, Nick, pointing to that idea that as COVID started to begin to recede in America, this, we started to kind of maybe frame our attention in other places around imagination right. and wonder. So it's a good year well, for science. I yeah, and I remember last year the impact that COVID had when the number one brand was Clorox because we took the survey when everyone was frantically wiping down everything in their house. What did you see as the sort of long-term impacts of COVID on that? Sort of the, the, the brands that we, that we rushed to during the pandemic when everything was shut down, did they keep their reputations up? How has that shifted as the year went on and the pandemic comes to an end? Right. What's what's interesting about the survey this year again is because we're looking at the most hundred most salient, most aware companies. Last year, as you said, uh, Clorox was number one. We also had Instacart, Peloton, right. basically all these companies that were your shelter in place companies that really perform well in the survey. Those companies weren't even on the list this year. Again, as Americans started to focus in in a different direction, a real big return to normalcy that shows up in those reputation rankings. I guess right. Yeah. Exactly. One thing that really jumped out for me this year was how politics is playing a role and companies that pop onto this list that you wouldn't expect to be there except for political controversy, like my pillow. What did you make of those kinds of trends? Right. So you had my pillow, you had Goya, you had the Trump organization. They were all on the list. Uh, those three in particular didn't perform very well against all Americans uh, in the complete survey. But again, the interesting part about um, sort of partisanship is it's a calculated risk, right? For companies to, right. to weigh into the debates. We saw both Delta and um, Coca-Cola rather decline 
a little bit uh, this year, especially Coca-Cola significantly. It, it dropped from 41 to 70 on the basis of, of that. Function of that might have been a bit of the fielding. We were in the field right during the Georgia voting law uh, uh, issues for the, both of those uh, fine companies. But the other thing I think is really interesting is you have Patagonia as our number one company this year, right. uh, followed by Chick-fil-A at number four. Now I try to imagine those two companies together at a corporate uh, retreat or a picnic. But what's real interesting is that you know Americans, whether they're Democrats, Republicans, or Independents, seem to respect those companies. So I, I'm curious what you think about that, Nick. But it feels like there's this sense of living your values, at least they're consistent. Exactly. Gives them some respect, maybe. Yeah, no, that's what jumped out at me when we saw the first results that Patagonia was number one, which is not one of the largest companies, not a company I'm dealing with every day, but it is very much a company that lives its value. That during the election, I mean, lived it on its sleeves. They printed uh, political messages in the lining of their clothing. So I think the lesson I took from that, and maybe this is a lesson that CEOs should be taking, that if you're going to live your politics, do it very deliberately. Don't shy away from it. Because if you're all in like a Patagonia, like a Chick-fil-A, not shy about your values and what you stand for, that kind of authenticity will be rewarded by consumers, which we saw in the top 10, those two companies up there very high. Absolutely. Uh, an another thing we follow a lot is the rise and fall of the tech giants and how that translates into the tech lash. Were there any top level uh, tech trends that you saw out of the data this year? This was really interesting this year, uh, Nick, because we had sort of this bifurcation of tech. We've always kind of talked about you know, um, big tech and it's not really. This year it was sort of good tech and bad tech. And really the, the big winner this year um, was probably Apple. You know, on the basis of their privacy, Apple sort of performed the highest um, at, at 16 in our ranking. But basically, we saw the, the decline of the social media platforms. Really remarkable. You know, Twitter was 93rd, TikTok 94th, Reddit was 76th. We had, um, you know, all kinds of controversies sort of supporting around uh, the platforms, obviously, this year. Um, and I think that's really become interesting is that the tech wars are starting to kind of create some skirmishes. We had a little bit of erosion uh, in Amazon, but Amazon is still a top 10 company, performs well. So it feels like if you are a technology company that was in the business of being inclusive, helping Americans through the pandemic, uh, you did well. Um, and if you were sort of a social media platform that, that sort of created some, sowed some division, particularly with the events of January 6th, uh, that created uh, some, some ill will among some Americans that created that erosion. Yeah, yeah, that's the same trend I feel like I'm seeing as well, that there are tech companies that provide products that we use every day. Amazon, of course, was a big winner in the COVID pandemic survey that we did last year. But the more people dig into the spread of misinformation um, on these social media sites, the lack of controls, uh, the seemingly arbitrariness of who's getting kicked off and who's not getting kicked off. I think we see that a ton in the data uh, as folks are really getting down on social media platforms. Okay, in the couple of minutes we have left, what are the top takeaways you give to corporate leaders who look at this if they want to boost their ratings or if they want to make sure they keep ones that are high? Well, stay out of politics. <laughs> I mean, I think if, if you're going to do it, uh, you better focus on on it in a way that's really inclusive, looking for social issues that aren't going to be divisive uh, in, in today's world. Um, but at the same time, I think you hit on it early about authenticity. This is incredibly important uh, this year. You know, the companies that helped Americans sort of weather the storm and get through the pandemic are the ones that that really respected. So I would really, you know, urge CEOs and their very difficult uh, difficult situation being forced at times, sometimes by their employees uh, to speak out on, on social issues. But we should find things that very much align with your vision and your purpose. And as you said, really reinforce your consistency and, and search for areas where you naturally fit. You know, if you're a technology right. company, work on, on Wi-Fi uh, issues in, in population that needs Wi-Fi, for example. Yeah, right. Be deliberate and be authentic about it seems to be the real takeaway. And a company that do that, uh, the, their customers seem to like them a lot. John, this was great. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope next year we can do it in person. And coming up next, my colleague, uh, Sarah Fisher, our Axios Media Trends reporter. Thanks, John. Thank you, Nick. I'm Sarah Fisher, media reporter for Axios. And joining us now from St. Paul, Minnesota, 3M Senior Vice President of Communications, Brian Henry. Brian, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Sarah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. 
of course. So our Axios Harris 100 poll found that 3M did extraordinarily well. And obviously you've had a banner year. What was your reaction to 3M's placement on the poll? You guys are number 28 uh, of all companies that were measured in the United States. We think the Axios Harris poll really gives you a good pulse on how people see us. And that's important because we want to be a trusted company. And we think over the last year, 3M has demonstrated not only the trustworthiness in our company and what we do, but how we approach it, uh, approach issues like a global pandemic, which is something none of us have really been thrown in the middle of. But at 3M, we have a proud history of stepping up when the world needs us to, and there was no greater need than this past year. And so we're very proud of what we've been able to accomplish. But more to the point, our 96,000 colleagues around the world banded together to step up when the world needed us the most. And at 3M, we feel that that was really well reflected in the Axios Harris poll. So 3M, typically an adhesives company. You know, people know you for post-it notes and scotch tape. And during the pandemic, you pivoted pretty quickly to producing masks. How did that pivot take place? Why did you decide to make that initiative and how has it paid off? Sure. So you're absolutely right. And we are a you know, brand loyal company, post-it notes here at the ready. And most people do know us from post-its and from scotch tape. But it's also important to understand that 3M is a company that delivers science and innovation to improve lives around the world in many different ways. And you just mentioned the pandemic response. And for us, it was a continuation of what we are really good at at 3M. And so if you look at the almost 120 years history of the company, there have been all types of things that have happened in the world. And in every single instance, 3M, our employees have always been able to pivot to deliver what the world needs. In this example, personal protective equipment, PPE, it was on everybody's lips and quite frankly, on most people's faces for most of 2020. And what we're proud of at 3M is that we were able to step up and meet the needs of the world. So when we needed to ramp up the number of respirators that we needed to make, we were able to do that. We were able to take people and focus them in on it and produce more than 2 billion. And we're on a run rate to do that this year. And so while there was a need across the board from our healthcare heroes who are on the front lines to people around the world, 3M was able to step up and deliver. And so we've been known for post-its, we've been known for scotch tape, but we're also known for N95 respirators and we couldn't be prouder for that. So that's an interesting pivot in a scientific way. I mean, you were doing engineering in terms of, like I said, uh, adhesives mostly. And now you're thinking about sort of healthcare engineering. How does the state of science reflect what you're doing. I know you do a lot of polling and research around that. Yeah, I appreciate you referencing State of Science Index. We announced our results last week. And so again, what we're seeing is that there is a growth across the world. We surveyed 17,000 people in 17 countries. And what we saw definitively was that the hope for what science can achieve and the trust in what science can do has really grown to almost an all time high in, in our polling. And what we find is that the demand for science to do more is significant. When you see vaccines, when you see PPE, when you see a lot of the things that have come along in the pandemic, there's a hunger for more of that. The good news is that at 3M, we're up for the challenge. And whether that is thinking about a, a, a ways to make vaccines more effective, whether it is evaluating ways to get PPE to more people, or whether it is looking at pandemic response overall and applying the learnings we've had in working with companies and countries around the world to get better at it, we feel there's a lot of things where 3M can really step in. It's beyond our products, but it's also our expertise. What have we learned in working with countries who are trying to insource these types of products and making sure they're ready for the next pandemic? Of course, we hope that that never happens again, but we feel like the lessons learned over the last year can't just be that we now know what PPE stands for. It is that we are smarter as a, a global community to stay ahead of, respond to, and be ready for the next pandemic. And we feel what 3M brings to the table there, again, from our expertise is something that goes beyond just manufacturing materials for people, but really it's bringing our ideas and applying that science to life in a fundamentally new way. So my question is, people expect you to do more, they believe in science, but as you said, hopefully there's not another pandemic, at least not soon. So how are you going to apply that expectation to the real world now that we hopefully don't have to get more vaccines and we're not having to wear PPE? Is there another science project that you're working on or thinking about? 
I think at 3M, we never stop thinking about science and we never stop finding ways to innovate. And I think if you look beyond the pandemic and you look at our business, as you mentioned, healthcare, I'll get to that in just a moment. But if you look at that, if you look at safety and industrial, if you look at our consumer business, if you look at our technology business, our transportation business, what we have are four strong businesses that really work across the world in so many different ways. So whether it's our transportation business, looking at ways to make smarter roads that are more intuitive, that actually can communicate with our cars to keep roads safer, all the way to addressing healthcare disparities through our health information systems business, which is able to identify where there could be issues for underrepresented populations, taking data and insights to apply to make sure people are getting the right treatment at the right time. Across the board, those are the types of things, the biggest challenges that 3M is taking on. And so again, whether it's finding new ways to collaborate, we've even taken the post-it note, made it digital. And you know, in this day and age where we're working from home or working remotely, we're finding new ways to make it easier for people to do their best work. We're also finding it finding new ways to make sure that the world is more competitive in every way and is safer in every way and is healthier in every way. And when we talk about applying science to life, those are the types of things we're talking about is really looking at what's next, what 3M technology can we take from one area of the business, apply it to another and come up with a completely new solution. With 60,000 products, the origin story through many of those is taking an idea in one part of our business and finding it has a lot of applications elsewhere and finding that you can even create not only a new business, but really you're providing new solutions to people who need it. And that's something that at 3M, we never stop doing that. That's an unbelievable stat, 60,000 products. I don't think I can name another company that produces 60,000 products. Wow. My final question for you, Brian, while I have you, is that it seems to me that generally companies are expected to take on more societal issues, you know, addressing a pandemic uh, than they were in the past. And that's really hard if you are in leadership at a company or you're trying to navigate your priorities. Suddenly, societal good may be just as important as shareholder value. How does 3M think about that trade off? It, for us, it comes down to a very simple three-step process. What we try to do is we listen, we understand, and we act. And as you think about whether it's ESG, which has been a, a hot issue for a number of companies, whether you think about its social justice and areas where we can step into and do more, we feel that for us, it's more important to understand from our communities, from our employees to listen and and begin to understand what they need so that we can deliver in a way and act in a way that's appropriate. I'll give you one example. One of the areas that we know that 3M can help is with science education for underserved populations. That's an area where we have scientific expertise, we have had a longstanding commitment to education, and there is something concrete we can do for the communities that we serve. And we feel that by following that path, listen, understand, act, we're able at 3M to do more good things for more people that we serve. And you're right, there's no um, shortage of interest of seeing how companies will step up and stand out. And we feel that if you look at the results of the Axios Harris poll, we did step up and stand out in 2020 and we look forward to doing so again in 2021. What a great note to end on, listen, understand, act. Brian Henry, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. And our final guests today are the Stago Group's President and Managing Partner, Mark Penn, and Vice Chair Ray Day. Ray is joining from Michigan and Mark joining from Washington, D.C. Thank you both so much for joining us today. Thank you for having us. And great to be here, Sarah. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So I want to talk about the Axios Harris poll that we commission every year. This year, some of the results were surprising. We saw that companies that take a definitive political or societal stand on issues did pretty well. I mean, Patagonia was the number one brand. Mark, what surprised you the most about this year's results? Well, I, I think the answer is a lot more sophisticated than that. I think some companies, Patagonia, Patagonia and Chick-fil-A, uh, did very well, even though they seem to be on different ends of the political spectrum. Whereas I think companies that got into the nitty gritty of ongoing uh, political issues, as opposed to having a general brand aura about them as standing for, uh, you know, behind certain values. Uh, those companies actually move back, you know, certain airlines and soft drink companies that, that really got caught in the middle of political issues. So I think the answer is a lot more uh, nuanced than, than just get involved with politics. In fact, I think that the answer is products really matter 
and be careful about your involvement in politics because it could boomerang or it could add to an aura, but it's a, a very precarious road you go down. So I just want to follow up with you on that, Mark. We hear from brands all the time that say, look, this is a precarious position. We need to be taking a stand on societal issues to meet consumer expectations. But then there's some things that are sort of radioactive if we go near them. What's your advice to those brands? How do you make those decisions? Well, uh, first, I think you have to take a products first approach. It's about products, not politics. That's why your consumers are consumers in the first place. And I think the more you forget that, the more I think you can run into problems. Second, issues are complex and nuanced in a way that I think that be sure, and I know it's a little self-serving, but I'll say it anyway, be sure to have people who are on both sides of the aisle really give you an explanation of the potential ramifications of your taking a position. Because you know, if you're a niche brand and you take a position on an issue and you have consumers very sympathetic to you, nothing will happen. If you're trying to be in every person's brand, right? If you try to be in every person's brand and suddenly you get in a political issue, you could lose 25, 30% of your customers and then have your image tanked because now you're a partisanized brand. Yeah, that's a good point. And Ray, to Mark's point, we did see some brands that are sort of everyday consumer friendly that did really, really well. I'm thinking about, you know, Apple did better than some of its tech peers. But then we also saw brands that were really niche. You know, think about Chick fil A that caters to people who really love fast food that did really well. What were some of the themes and through lines that you found that might have been surprising? Yeah, I think, Sarah, what we're seeing, and to build on Mark's point, we see three main components of corporate reputation today. The product component that Mark talked about, there's a character component, and it's all bounded by trust. And to have a strong, a growing, uh, accelerating reputation, you really need to work all three. So today, absolutely, the price of entry is to have strong products and services. But those companies that really dominated the top 10, they did equally well on character. And the trust was exponential in their brands and their companies. So it's really the combination. I always think of reputation as an equation. It's the sum of your company performance, the way you behave, and then how you communicate or market that that determines whether your reputation goes up or whether it declines. Ray, you look through these results every year with a fine tooth comb and you know every company on that list. One of the things that we've discussed is that if you look cumulatively at some of these industries, it's remarkable which ones performed really well over the past year during the pandemic and which ones have just tanked. Can you walk us through a few of those trends? Which industries seem to be doing really well? Which have room for improvement? Yeah, so overall, I, I think if you look at this year, we're getting back to a more normal level of reputation. The COVID bump that we saw in the past 12 to 18 months is beginning to wane. So if you look at the top 10 a year ago, you had three supermarkets in the top 10. You had Clorox number one. That COVID effect is starting to diminish, not entirely, pharma. Moderna was on our list for the first time. And Pfizer had the strongest improvement year over year of any company among the 100 on our list at 10% improvement year over year. But I think when you look at sectors, you mentioned tech. So we saw tech plateau or reach a high point in 2017. And then during COVID, we really saw tech being given a second chance. Everybody was relying on tech to keep us connected and the whole debate over privacy and good tech or bad tech, that started to die down. In this year's results, we're seeing tech start to have a decline again. And you pointed it out, Google was in decline, all the major tech companies, it was only Apple that posted a year over year reputation gain. When you look at other sectors this year, we saw uh, big oil start to stabilize. We saw CPG on the incline. We saw financial services. You, know, that, you, know, you think back to 2008 and 2009, where the financial institutions were blamed as part of the problem. Today, we're seeing them come back uh, stronger. Airlines mixed, the streaming services, we're starting to see a bit of fatigue, maybe oversaturation of the market. 
And then what we, Mark and I like to call the, the Musk touch. You know, Musk, Musk ha, Elon Musk has two companies now in the top 10. So there's the Midas touch and the, the Musk touch, touch. And I think what we're seeing there is anything that takes us to where we haven't been before, space or new modes of mobility is starting to gain reputation and favor among the public. So interesting at a time where people were sort of stuck at home and unable to experience new things, sort of craving that out of body experience. Uh, Mark, I want to pivot to you. This is an audience question that I thought was a good one. We've been doing this poll together now for many years, Harris and Axios, but I know you are a polling expert and have been doing polling forever. What are the differences right now when you look at brand reputations today in a list like this versus what you saw maybe 10 years ago? 20 years ago, what types of companies are doing better or worse? Well, uh, I, I think as Ray said, you know, in today's world, uh, and I call it almost the rough and tumble world of cor corporate reputation, you know, it, it, we, you really have a situation in which people can go up and down fairly significant numbers based on actions they took or programs they ran or events that occurred in ways that generally didn't happen. I mean, corporate reputation surveys were sleepy affairs. You know, J&J &J just was on top forever. Uh, and it was that way every year. And then if you had something that was out of order, you'd wonder what happened. I, I think what you're seeing is not so much the demographics are changing. I think that the spotlight on corporations, look at what's happening to tech, the more they are involved, I think, with political and First Amendment questions, the more they are taking a something that was universally admired and, and now seeing that they're gonna be fractured somewhat by, uh, by politics. And, and I think as Ray pointed out, when people were in the pandemic, they really appreciated companies that delivered for them. And you see now that the vaccine is out there that Pfizer and Moderna are doing really well. So I think you see that right now, Corporate reputation can be a little bit more event driven, a little bit more transitory than it used to be in the past. And it means if you're running a corporate reputation department, you just can't sit back and rest on your laurels. You gotta be out there every day and rolling with events. Mark, I have just one final question and it's for you. Now we see companies getting involved in the pandemic recovery. They're doing all of these things like production of masks or what have you. Do you think post pandemic, those companies are still going to be expected reputationally to continue doing things for the societal good over shareholder value? Well, I think that's a question that we haven't really come to fully appreciate where, where the, the gap is or isn't. Investors don't drive corporate reputation more or less what drives corporate reputation in this survey is much more the consumers who see and use the products. I think as Ray said, they wanna trust the company. They wanna know that it's consistent in what it stands for. They wanna know that it has values. Uh, and, and they're actually a little bit less about exactly what those values are than that they have them, that they stick to them, that they're consistent in what they do. And those are the kinds of images that endure the ups and downs of everyday events. And Ray, before I let you go, what's one company to watch based off of this year's poll? Well, I don't know that we ever single out uh, any one company, but I would look at those that are in the top 10. You know, Mark mentioned Chick-fil-A, um, mentioned, you know, Chick-fil-A is one that I think we always look at. It has a point of view. It's taken a very laser sharp focus on its product lineup. It hasn't wandered in a lot of different directions. And just consistently year after year after year, we see reputational improvement. The politics aside and what people think of their politics, just from a delivery standpoint, it's a consistent performer. And there are others in the top 10. But what I always like to look at as a student of reputation is year over year progress, consistent performance. And as Mark said, that's what the consumer is looking at, consistency and value over time. Consistency, super strong note to end on there. Mark Penn and Ray Day, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Sarah. And thank you all for joining this afternoon for another awesome virtual conversation that has made everyone smarter, faster. Thank you to the Harris Poll for your awesome data and for making this possible. 
For more information on this, you can sign up for my newsletter, Axios Media Trends on axios.com slash newsletters, or you can take a look at the Axios app. Thank you all for joining. We'll see you on axios.com. And in just a few minutes, join us on Twitter Spaces at 115. We're going to continue the conversation to talk about which brands made the top 100 in the poll. You can join us by heading to at Axios at Twitter.